Center. Thank you for joining us for our final presentation of the U.S. Center. We are going to have another quick NASA hyperwell showing um, from 12:30 to about 12:45 today. But this is our last full-length presentation. Um, if you have joined us before, thank you. If this is your first time, welcome. The U.S. Center is a public diplomacy effort that the State Department has been putting on at COPS for the past four years since Copenhagen. And even though this is our last presentation for this COP, we will be around next year in Warsaw, so please write it on your calendar a year from now and make sure to come check us out because we'll have another two weeks of great programs featuring all kinds of climate change efforts and initiatives um, from U.S. researchers, from partners, both abroad and domestically, and we'd love to show them off to you again. Um, this morning, our presentation is called Landsat, 40 Years of Watching the Earth Change. We have two speakers, two um, esteemed scientists from NASA. Our first is Dr. Shahid Habib. Uh, Dr. Habib is, is currently the Chief of Office of Applied Sciences in the Earth Sciences Division at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He is responsible for transitioning science research results and products to operational end users for societal benefits. Um, currently, he is leading many projects dealing with the water balance studies in the Middle East, North Africa region, flood forecasting in East Africa, Himalayan glacier melt impact on stream flow, and Gulf of Mexico hypoxia impact. Our second speaker is Dr. Jack Kay. Jack Kay currently serves as Associate Director for, the research, for research of the Earth Science Division within NASA's Science Mission Directorate. Earlier positions in his more than 28-year career at NASA include being a space scientist at the Goddard Space Flight F Center and manager of the Atmosphere Chemistry Modeling and Analysis Program. As Associate Director for Research, Dr. K is responsible for the research and data analysis programs for Earth System Science, covering the broad spectrum of scientific disciplines that constitute it. And with that, um, I'd like to give you Dr. Habib. Good morning, and uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And good morning for being here. This is the last day of the conference, and uh, I'm glad uh, you guys are here, and uh, there are some people following us on the web. So this is really good. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, going to spend some time and walk you through the history of uh, Landsat, Landsat la satellite, and also show you some imagery which has been captured as Earth has changed, as our home planet has changed in the last 40 years captured by the satellite from space. So bef I don't know if you're familiar with Landsat or not, but some of the, I, I'm glad some of the students are here too, so maybe I'll take a minute or so and talk about it. So Landsat is a sensor or a spacecraft which has been in space. Uh, the program actually was launched in 1972. There are several missions have been launched. Uh, so Landsat 5 is still in space, that was launched 1985, and Landsat 7, which was launched in 1999, that is still in space operating, and we are going to be also launching Landsat 8, and that will be in February 2013. So Landsat's main purpose is look at the changing planet, land cover, land use, how the Earth is transforming over time, building a time series, getting a record, and this is the greatest sensor. It has captured over three million images of the planet since its inception. So what I'm going to do here is before I begin also about talk about some of the imagery, I thought I may spend just a brief amount of time and tell you when we're talking about Landsat imagery, how the images are captured. I think maybe it's a good idea to have a little bit of understanding of the physics here, what we're talking about, because people sometimes get confused that uh, this is a camera which is taking a picture. It is not a camera. It's a radiometer which is actually catching the radiation coming from the Earth, and then the images are created by computer, by algorithms. So what this simply it means is that what nature has given us the spectral band, we're looking at on the screen here the portion of the spectral band. So you're looking at from starting from point three on my left hand side here, going all the way to about 2.5 here microns. And this is uh, essentially uh, the, representing the wavelengths and just a small portion of the spectrum. I'm not talking about the high energy portion of the spectrum or the low end of the spectrum, which is on the far end, which is not shown here. So most of the stuff here on the left is visible spectrum, 
and that's where the bands one, two, three, and so are the Landsat visible spectral bands. Then there is a near infrared stuff which is following in this area. Most of these images which you see, they are from the reflected energy. So when the sun is shining on the planet, the energy gets reflected back. It's giving, radiation is going back in the reflected spectrum and near infrared spectrum. So these images, the radiometer or the instrument on the Landsat spacecraft captures that energy. And from that energy, then images are created by converting, the, going through the, some engineering process. And then the images are made by computer algorithms. So this is the portion of the spectrum, how these images are made. We are not talking about the emission part of the spectrum, which is really the 11 to 14 micron range. That's where the emitted energy, natural emission, black body radiation, I mean, some of you can look it up on the web, what I mean, but I just wanted to make sure that you understand this is how these images are created. Next. What you're looking at here is change over time. Here from 1985 to 2000, and this is really a very interesting image. You're looking at here in the middle of the screen, which is just going to go away, actually in Indonesia, the glaciers in Indonesia. And as time has gone by, these glaciers have really receded. You can see that. I mean, this is really a, an excellent example of that, what climate is doing to our planet. And now it's, the screen is scrolling, cursor is scrolling back, and, and you can see 85, this is how the top of the Jaya Mountain looked like. And I think I'm gonna just wait, well, i show you one more time, let the cursor go back and you see how it looks now. Um, of course, this image was taken in 2009. Probably it is almost non-existent now. This ice is non-existent there now. So this is, see how small the ice patch is there now. Next. This is really a beautiful image captured by Landsat. Aral C. If you're not familiar with the geography, let me just spend a minute or so. Aral C is between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. It is uh, fed by two rivers, Amu Darya and Sire Darya. And Amu Darya, I think, uh, comes from Himalayan Mountains. The image you're looking at here is uh, 1977, and going on the far end is 2010. And you can appreciate just looking at these three images how the transition has taken place over this period, which is really 1977 to 2010, and we're talking about a little over 30 years, and how the transition has taken place, the shrinking of the RLC. And this is, uh, this is one of those man-made changes because a lot of the water of, the, arals, uh, of the, the rivers were diverted for agriculture use, and that helped really in the shrinking process. We're gonna zoom into city of Beijing. Nineteen seventy eight. This is the outline of the city of Beijing. This is the center of the city. That's where the forbidden city is. Now look. It is expanding and continue to expand. All these red patches here, what you see, that is the expansion of Beijing. Seven million people to twelve over twelve million people. And still still continue to expand. Big footprint, big construction, a lot of the greenery is gone. And of course, you can put two and two together what this means to the carbon footprint and other things. This is uh, a Tatürk dam in Turkey. 
over time, and now it here. And uh, dam, if you want to sort of uh, focus your eyes, and this is where the dam is. It's a big hydroelectric power plant. In the past, this is the way it looked like. And now, in 2010, after the dam is, has gone into operation, there are some benefits to it, too. All of this area has been irrigated, and there's a much better water management scheme, which we see now by damming the water of the river upstream there here, headwaters of the river, and then controlling the water flow, and at the same time producing electricity and a better management scheme for the water. This image is 1985, and the mid-panel is 1990. That's when the, some of the development is taking place. This is not too far from here. Image is really self-explanatory. Beautiful image. You can see that uh, how the Dubai is expanding, and particularly the Palm Island. And this is just within 10 years or 11 years. Major expansion. And this is, um, of course, a lot of the deposition was done in the Gulf, and then the island was created. A lot of housing and other, I guess, other aspects there. Next. What you're looking at is uh, Dead Sea. This is, uh, Israel is on my left here, West Bank. Jordan is here on my right. And this is Dead Sea. Jordan River comes from the north, and there is no outlet. This is the lowest point on this planet. This is about 1,300 feet below sea level, and very deep. This, this actually has been created by Rift Valley. There is a, there is a rift where the Asia and Africa continent is coming apart, and that's what they call the rift area that runs all the way through Africa. And this crevice, of course, the river has flown into it. <clears throat> and this is, the, but as I said, the deeper, deepest point is about, <clears throat> pardon me, 1,300 feet deep. And look how this has been changing in terms of evaporation. Majority of the loss here is due to the evaporation and salt. And this is the saltiest sea. Or it's 30% more than the regular seawater. And now you, you, can, you can see some structures which are not visible here. Those structures are visible in this area. And some of these more are, going, are becoming visible in 2011 image. And a lot of the potash and the salt comes from this area. And the history is that even um, back Egyptians, back, uh, of course, during the time of pharaohs, they used to take the salt from this area and preserve the mummies. And it's a beautiful image. This is uh, also not too far from here. You're looking at the portion of Saudi Arabia. And this is the area in the, from north of uh, uh, Riyadh and bordering Jordan. And uh, this is a good example where Saudis have actually drilled down way deep in that area. They have gone down more than one kilometer deep to find water. And the water wells have developed, and the agri agriculture has progressed in that area. So all these green dots, what you're seeing, these are agriculture fields. They're close to one kilometer wide. And uh, of course, the, the issue here is, one is the positive story, that what you're seeing, that how in this thing has progressed in time and water has been found and the irrigation is the, there at this time. But there is very less precipitation in this area. And when you have a less precipitation, there is a 
runoff and there is not that much recharge, especially when the aquifers are very deep or the water table is very deep. And the projections are the water is probably enough for the next 50 years or so in this area, and after that, this area is going to run dry because of the less recharge. Yeah, please. This is um, 1990 time frame. An image is going to come up. This is all desert here, but you're looking at the reflection, maximum reflection coming back. But the oil wells were on fire during the 1990 time frame. And this is a Landsat imagery, true color imagery, showing the fires. I mean, it was visible from space, very vivid. Jacobs Haven Glacier, that's in Greenland ice sheets. And starting from 1851, since we started keeping record, now of course we do that by Landsat and other instru instrument or spacecrafts we fly. And we also have flown many airborne campaigns in that region. But you can see that how this glacier is receding. 1851, and now it's here. All of this area is melting. And that the calculations have shown now that there is about 20 meter, the velocity of this thing is about 20 meters per day. That's, that's the distance it's moving. This is a Columbia Glacier in Alaska. And look where the new snow comes in, where the ice is, new snow comes in. And this is actually a um, very difficult area to measure because if we know exactly where the line of equilibrium is, you know, where the new snow comes in, where the ice line is, then I think we can have a much better handle on the understanding of the glacier dynamics. But unfortunately, this is very difficult. You never know where exactly the line of equilibrium is, where evapotranspiration takes place directly, or ablation zone is. Because this, some of that is ablation zone here. This new snow comes in and melts. And this is fairly deep glacier. And we don't know exactly how deep it is, unless you really drill the hole on there, which is not practical. So Landsat has been an excellent tool for particularly for the glaciologists that they can map these glaciers exactly using uh, GPS tools and plus Landsat imagery and some other static maps to know exactly the outline of the glaciers and then keep on updating it using remote sensing techniques. That's the best we can do. Because other things about glaciers, you really want to know the three dimensions to a glacier if you want to understand the glacier melt. But we cannot find those things very easily. So this is the best tool. And Landsat actually has been used extensively for Alaska. And USGS um, has published a document, actually. You can go on the web and see that which actually has shown all the outlines of the glaciers for Alaska. And, and uh, there has been uh, some work by ECMOD, which is an uh, international organization located in Nepal. They have used Landsat imagery mapping the Himalayan glaciers. And I also want to recognize USG, USGS uh, con uh, contribution. Actually, that is the agency. NASA develops the Landsat uh, spacecraft. And USGS, United States Geological Survey, they operate the spacecraft. This is uh, Yellowstone National Park. That's in the state of Wyoming. And very thick in greenery, and also has some actual uh, geothermal activity in that area. 
that sometimes fire strikes in the region and there is major destruction due to lightning or sometimes man-made, both. And here, what we're seeing is really a good example. Over time, destruction due to fire. A lot of the forest has been lost, but there is a regrowth of the fire, natural, and also the better management techniques by the forestry, and it comes back. It's turning green here in, this, in some of these areas. This is a true color image of the South Pole. Now the South Pole is covered completely by ice. And this is a true color image. 1,100 scenes have been used to create this image. And 30 meter resolution. Celeste? This is one of my favorite. This is um, not a true color, as you can see. But anybody wants to guess where is this? Where? You're close. <laughs> this is Ganges, uh, Ganges Delta, how the Ganges River is emptying into Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, they all run together. And look how the sedimentation is coming to the bay. This is really the science message behind this thing is for environmentalists and people to worry about. This is the message one needs to be looking at. Look how the sedimentation is coming into the sea. What is that sedimentation carrying? Is it carrying a lot of the fertilizer? Is it providing nutrients to the sea, which we probably sometimes don't need? More nutrients than we what's naturally going in, plus it's carrying a lot of the other debris which goes in. It's a huge area. And this is a very good depiction by, uh, from space where you can see that transition zone, deep blue to different color. And this is not only the Ganges problem, I don't want to pick on Ganges. This is a problem with most of the river deltas. We're south, let's go north. This is, uh, we're looking at a beautiful imagery of uh, Lena River. It empties into Laptop Sea up north. The river originates somewhere by Bakal, Lake Bakal, travels about 2,800 kilometers, one of the longest Russian river. And you can see some thawing out here. That's a north. I mean, naturally it freezes up on the thawing out. And this area is uh, also, the environmentalists say, that's uh, fairly contaminated because of a lot of the other chemical uh, damage which has been done to the river, and that sort of flows and empties into the laptop. This is again another um, glacier in the western part of uh, Alaska, Malaspina. This glacier is about 50 kilometers wide and more or less 50 kilometers uh, long as well. And it's really a nice imagery how some of the softer portion or maybe ice, uh, snow, or maybe debris here. And this is ice here in this area. That's what you're seeing. And my, uh, my sense is probably this is somewhat fresh so snow and maybe uh, some debris in this area. Because some of these glaciers, they do get covered by debris. Next, please. OK, thanks. Uh, 
This is the last chart I have, and this is a depression in the Sahara, on the western side of Sahara. And uh, what you're looking at is Rashad, Rashad um, depression. And a lot of this, these uh, formations of the rocks are sedimentary. Sedimentary means the deposition of the material over time. And this is uh, a lot of speculations about it, but um, the, probably the most uh, best one which fits the bill is that there has been some volcanic activity in that area millions of years ago, and because of that, the structure was created. You can see that, actually, as I read about it. This is visible from space by naked eye. And this is uh, close to 50 kilometers wide. And some of these rings are five kilometers wide and this is in close to the area western part of Africa Mauritania that's where it is really a beautiful image and you can see the color transition here how the a lot of the calcites say actually reflect back actually people another thing which maybe I should mention here and, and unfortunately I don't have an example to show you is um, People actually have used Landsat imagery for studying geology. And, uh, and people who are very clever scientists, they have some good results. It's not only studying uh, the greenery, but I think people study rocks using uh, uh, Landsat imagery as well. Well, thank you. This was my last chart. So this was just a journey through 40 years, uh, what Landsat has captured for us. There are many more on the web, and this is one, one of NASA's contribution. You can log on, you can download these images, you can see those images, you can read about those images, and you can be more knowledgeable than what I was just working from my memory. And there are several young people probably, and they are much faster with computers and things like that. They can really access this thing much bit faster than I can. It really uh, great. Thank you for being here, and uh, I'll take any questions if you have. Yes, sir. Uh, let me give you. Yes. Uh, sometimes the color is not enough to enter gravitation. He says this is, for example, this is salt accumulation. This is uh, calcite. This is vegetation. Sometimes he make mistake when you want to in visual way, so that you must use the ground truth in uh, digital uh, classification, and supervised or unsupervised. But I asked the question about the desert area, which the based channel or wavelength uh, fitful uh, soil classification, and you can identification of types of soil. In desert area, a problem. I make some uh, research about the soil classification in desert of Iraq. I, uh, many limitation factors because uh, sometimes gypsy ferrous soil is close in reflection with cal, uh, or calcareous soil or sandy soil. What's the best way or which the wavelength is suitable? for good classification. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I think uh, you're really talking like a scientist, and good question. Uh, you're absolutely right, especially when uh, I didn't touch upon the validation part of this thing. Naturally, you have to have ground truthing what you're looking at, because remote sensing is still an art. How you take the information and convert that into an image but somebody has to validate that, and you have to have ground truth thing, and I, I second that, what you just said. Other thing what you're saying is really the soil classification. That is still, people are working on it. This is really a big question within NASA also. The soil community looking at it, what is the best way to classify the soil? I mean, there is um, FAO record right now. There are about 200 classifications of the soil. You can see that there is FAO uh, classification. It's published. But I think people want to improve a lot more on that. And visible spectrum is still being used for that. Now, we're hoping that the microwave spectrum, which uh, emission, L-band, which we're hoping that when we launch the SMAP satellite, 
which is going to be launching in a couple of years. That's a soil moisture satellite. We're hoping that there will be techniques where the L-band radiometry would give us a better information in developing soil classifications. Any more questions? Okay, thank you everyone. And if you want to see one last showing, um, 1230, uh, Dr. Jack Hay will be presenting more Landsat images. Thank you so much. On the last day, I'm really impressed so many uh, folks showed up. Excellent. Thanks for being here.